waiting a couple more minutes to get everyone into into the webinar we had this set up with a waiting room <laughs> which is hard to see when you're you got all the things up on your screen but So I'll just start some of the introductions again while we wait for people to enter into the webinar. Again, welcome to our webinar series on managing neonicotinoids in row crops. I want to thank everyone that helped make this webinar series possible, including the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Foods and Markets, uh, the EPA, the pet, through a pesticide environmental stewardship grant that we received here, um, and through the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture through a grant that um, UVM has received to work on crop, crop protection and pest management programs. So thank you to everyone that has helped make this possible, including my own team here at UVM Extension, the Northwest Crops and Soils team. And you hardly ever see Susan Brulette on the forefront, but everybody gets emails from her. <laughs> and uh, she is our fearless program manager helping to uh, put, there she is, put all these things into place and uh, make all the wheels turn in the background and we definitely couldn't do this without her. So thank you, Susan. Um, we have a great series planned. I think many folks understand that uh, we're continuing to always evaluate the pesticides and the pesticide programs that we have in place <clears throat> in agriculture. And there's been a lot of concern um, and need for review and some uh, thoughtful input and research and outreach and education focused on the use of neonicotinoids um, in agriculture in general, but my areas in row crops um, and forage crops and livestock. So our goal here is to help provide outreach and education on this topic to the people that we work with here in Vermont and the surrounding area. Um, to help us better understand these pesticides and <clears throat> maybe people on the call don't even know really what a neonicotinoid is um, and what it does and, and why are we concerned and what risks do they pose and how can we minimize that risk. And so we hope that you learn all of that and more by attending the webinar series. And this is going to continue over time, this um, insecticide classes you know, going to continue to be under review um, and criticism, really. And so it's our role in agriculture to do our best to manage this pesticide and minimize risks. All right, so I want to welcome the first speaker in our series, uh, Steve Duanell, who's with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Foods and Markets, and is relatively new to Vermont and joined the agency Maybe what two years ago, Steve? I'm not even sure. Has it been two years? No, no, not quite. September of 22. <laughs> okay, so he hasn't been here very long, and he um, has been here to sort of lead the Ag Innovation Board. And you're going to be hearing a lot more about that and what that is and how it's related to this whole topic of neonicotinoids over the next 40 or so minutes. But I just wanted to make sure people know that you will receive a professional development CCA CEU credit today. And you can also receive uh, pesticide applicator credits as well. Um, just so everybody knows, this is the first webinar in a series of webinars on this topic. And hopefully you'll be able to attend them all, um, hearing from experts from around the region that are working um, diligently around risk management and impacts um, outside of agriculture. And really, again, trying to educate us on how do we best <clears throat> manage these risks. <clears throat> Our last webinar at, uh, on December 21st will really be to get questions and feedback. Uh, we really wanna hear from you. We wanna hear from our stakeholders about their thoughts, um, what they think about the recommendations um, and 
you know, maybe even some ideas of things that you've been thinking about or needs, uh, educational needs that people may have, uh, again, to help us manage the risks here. All right, so again, you can uh, get a certified crop advisor CEU credit today, uh, one for each webinar, and I'll put up the QR code at the web end of the webinar. And then if you need pesticide applicator credits, uh, they're available for most of the sessions. So to receive a credit, please email Susan Brulette at uvm.edu. You'll need to send your name and your PAT number. Um, you can send it through the chat. Also, if you want, just send it to her privately um, and she'll make sure that you get some credits. All right, so with that, I think, Steve, I am ready to um, send it over to you. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, try to share my screen. Hopefully this works. If anybody um, has questions as uh, Steve is going through his webinar, you can just type those into the chat. Um, you know, if it's a clarifying question, uh, I'll probably stop Steve and ask if he can answer that. Otherwise, we'll um, answer them after his presentation. I think most people know how to use the chat, so we'll go from there. All right, Steve, thank you. Thank you, and 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 you know, Heather, it's your discretion as to whether you want to ask the question while I'm okay. in the middle of it, or I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Okay. Uh, but first of all, uh, thank thank you for the opportunity. Uh, to talk to everybody today about this topic. Um, this is something that uh, has been front and center of what we've been doing at the agency uh, for a while. And certainly since I came on board, we've been uh, spending a lot of time and effort on this issue. And so what I'm gonna do today is talk uh, just a sort of a general introduction on uh, what neonicotinoids are, and then uh, more time talking about the work of the Agricultural Innovation Board and, and what, what the conclusions are of the work that, that's been done so far. So first of all, neonicotinoids are a class of insecticides. They're relatively new, um, in 1990s essentially. They're similar. They were based on the, the toxicity effects on insects of nicotine, which has been used as insecticide for a long time. Unfortunately, it has um, some mammalian toxicity and so through um, you know designing the molecules the um, this these this group was was produced that has um, much lower mammalian toxicity and therefore is a lot more suitable for use as a pest management tool um, they have a number of characteristics which are important to what we're talking about and one is that they're moderately water soluble and as a result, they are they tend to be systemic insecticides, which means that they get into the plant itself. And that provides a number of benefits for insect control, but also can lead to some issues with, with non-target effects. Uh, currently, they're the most widely group, most widely used group of insecticides due to the fact that they are so um, relatively non-toxic and so that you know adds a significant safety margin to their use and their their effectiveness the group that we're talking about in, in use in vermont includes these five products imidacloprid clothianidin thiamethoxam dinotefuron and acetamiprid those materials are all registered in the state we've got a lot of registrations different formulations different brand names uh all Neonicotinoids are registered in Vermont. Only of these products that are registered in Vermont, if they have outdoor uses, they're classified as restricted use pesticides in Vermont, state restricted use or class A products, which means they have to be uh, used or the use has to be supervised by a person certified for that type of application, for example, agriculture or uh, turf management or whatever that happens to be. So there, are, there is that control over their use. And of course, you know, I don't really need to go into this too, because of course there are label directions for use and you have to follow label, label's a law. So all the uses of neonicotinoids are, are uh, controlled or regulated by the, the directions for use that are on the federally approved in the state accepted label. Treated seeds, which is what we're gonna be talking about a lot today, 
uh, are not, the seeds themselves are not regulated as pesticides. They're considered treated articles and under the way pesticide law works in the United States, once an article has been treated with an approved pesticide or a registered pesticide, the article itself is not regulated as a pesticide. There are other things that apply to it, but the treated seeds themselves are not regulated as pesticides and therefore the planting of those seeds does not have to be done by a certified applicator. Just a little bit of uh, comparison of toxicity just for context more than anything. And I didn't uh, put any of the information here about mammalian or bird or fish or aquatic organisms, just focusing on honeybees, because that's the test organism that the uh, EPA uses to evaluate potential risk to pollinators as a group. The, the tests are done on, on uh, the Western honeybee. Um, and so just, just to, you know, sort of put it in context. So the first four columns there, or excuse me, the first three columns are neonicotinoids. Then we have a couple of pyrethroids and organophosphate and another type of insecticide called a diamide. And just so you can see some of the comparison of the toxicities, when it comes to acute LD50, um, the pyrethroids actually are um, more toxic uh, in, in some cases. Uh, and the reason I put bifenthrin 48 uh, and the, uh, I think it's, I can't really see the slide, I think it's chlorantronilipril. Um, these are all products that can potentially be used either as seed treatments or in furrow treatments to control insect pests or in corn planting. Um, so I just wanted to include those for comparison. So you can see that clothianidin, which we'll talk about in a minute, is the most widely used seed treatment in Vermont, has, you know, is is toxic, extremely toxic or highly toxic to uh, to honeybees when it's tested against them. And uh, either comparable to the other neonicotinoids or more toxic than the pyrethroids, the organophosphates, and the diamides. The other consideration is their environmental fate. And the issues here are, uh, you know, how long the material re remains in the environment after you use it. And the characteristics that are typically looked at are the, the ability of the, or the hydrolysis um, of the material, how it breaks down to water, how it breaks down uh, in water with sunlight, how it breaks down in aerobic soil, how it breaks down in anaerobic soil, and then aerobic and anaerobic um, uh, metabolism. And then a characteristic, which is essentially its ability to bind to organic matter, like the KD or KOC. Uh, and in these cases, so for the first uh, six columns, uh, a big number is not what you, you want to avoid the bigger numbers, but when it comes to KOC or KF, you want a high number there. So what I've highlighted in yellow are the um, characteristics that are the least desirable, I guess you could say, um, for, for in terms of environmental fate consideration. So you can see that clothianidin has, rel has one of the, some of the highest aerobic soil metabolism numbers. Uh, aerobic soil metabolism depends a lot on the soil conditions and the test conditions. So this is just a range, but you can see that under some circumstances, the aerobic soil metabolism for this product is is pretty pretty long. Uh, it can persist at some level. Uh, we don't talk about the levels here, but at some level, can be found in soil. You know, years after it's been applied. Um, when it comes to the uh, partition coefficient or how strongly it absorbs the soil, clothianidin is one of the, the least absorbed materials, which means it tends to be more mobile um, in the soil, as opposed to some of the other materials, the bifenthrins and the, or the pyrethroids and the diamides. Um, so, I, you know what, Heather, at this point, I may be would be good to get a question. This is kind of technical and the other stuff I'm gonna be talking about is entirely different. So it might be good to see if anybody has any questions so far. Yeah, okay, that sounds good. All right, Are, do folks have any questions for for Steve? Um, I know I, 
I have one. Are the the so there's these different pesticides that have the neonicotinoids in them as the active ingredient. Mm -hmm. How do we know how, like do you know how broadly like what what are they used on? I'm most familiar with the fact that they're on seed treatments, so oh. on the seed coatings, but where else That's are they the, commonly used in Vermont okay, agriculture? So just so everybody knows, Heather and I didn't rehearse this, but no. it's the next slide. <laughs> oh, it is? <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, are there any other questions for Steve? All right. I don't see any, so we'll continue on. Yeah, okay. So that's the other thing I was going to cover was the uses in Vermont. Um, so these products are used, they have a wide range of, of uses. Um, in structural pest control, in water ornamental uh, pest control, in uh, general agricultural pest control, greenhouses. Um, you know, like I said, they're widely used materials and they're effective and they're relatively, you know, they have a high, uh, I never say a pesticide is safe because all pesticides are toxic, but they have a, a wider safety margin for use than some of the other materials, the pyrethroids, especially the organophosphates which is why they're so widely used. But we in Vermont, uh, applicators who are certified in, uh, we're considered commercial applicators, what are considered non-commercial applicators, people who are applying to, to their employer's property, uh, government applicators, they all have to report their use uh, annually. And so for 2021, these were the neonicotinoid product uses that were reported to the agency. And so the total amount that was um, reported for those categories in 2021 was 915.53 pounds. The bulk of that was 646 pounds on, for lawn, lawn care and ornamental applications, uh, 168 pounds uh, golf courses, very small amount of greenhouse nursery, general pest control 96, and then produce production was four pounds. So low, you know, it is used, but the amount reported to us is, you know, relatively low. And you can see the total is 915 pounds. The bulk of the neonicotinoids that are used in Vermont are used on treated seed. And we do require reporting on treated article seed that is distributed in Vermont. It's a relatively new program, so we're still working out the kinks on getting all the reporting done. But what we have learned so far is that, you know, essentially 100%, 99.6% of the corn seed that was distributed that was reported to us was treated with neonicotinoids. 87% of the corn was treated using clothianidin. 13% with thiamethoxam. When you can't, we don't, um, so to calculate the total amount, we, there's a range of application uh, rates on seed, anywhere from 0.25 to 1.5, 1.25 milligrams per seed. And if you use a average of 30,000 seeds per acre and uh, 90,000 acres of corn and essentially, you know, 99.6% of the 90,000 acres was planted, you end up with between uh, 1,482 and 7,400 total pounds per year. And that's for the, you know, all the, all the corn acreage. Uh, in terms of the actual rate per acre, which is probably the most important metric we use when you talk about pesticides, uh, it's between 0 0.02 and 0 0.08 pounds of active ingredient per acre. And, and the one thing to keep in mind about that is that that's about a tenth of what would, or less, of what would be applied for the same material if it was applied as an infero treatment or as a foliar treatment. So when materials, like for example, for the uh, modern ornamental applications, the maximum annual application rate is 0.4 pounds. So, uh, you know, 10 times more than what would be applied when it's applied as a treated seed. And that's one of the reasons that the use of treated seeds has been adopted so widely is because it reduces the amount applied per acre by a factor of 10. 
so much less material is put out into uh, into a treated uh, field or to a field. So it's a much more effective way to apply the material in terms of achieving the uh, pest control objective. And it reduces the total amount that's applied over an area. Um, so then, so that's for corn. We also did an estimate for soybeans, uh, much less of the soybean acreage uh, or soybean seeds that are reported to us are treated with neonicotinoids, uh, 34%. Um, and then we, you know, did the same calculation and ended up with less than 200 pounds of neonicotinoids applied per year uh, in Vermont. Um, so anyway, any questions so far? Uh, no, but I have a question. I have another question, but it may be your next slide. Uh, <laughs> yes. I wonder, um, can do you know any of the trade names? So I, I see there is um, there are some farmers on the call, which is great. And just no, I, they I may be. Not, yeah, I mean, I don't know the trade names and, you know, try to avoid that, actually. But yeah, no, um, I, I know. I just trying to help the farmers relate to names that they've heard you know compared to these products so maybe it's right. something i'll i'll type that in the um in the chat yeah. but right. um uh in the pie chart that you showed just yes. a metacloprid use or we're all or is this all neo this, is all, all, this is all of it but it's it's the bulk of it's a metacloprid a metacloprid uh, we actually have a report we provided to the AIB yesterday that breaks this down further, which we can send to you and you can put on the in the chat or attach to the send email to everybody. Yeah, but the bulk of the material used in these uh, uses is is a medic cloprid. So the people need you mentioned something about needing a license to purchase. So I see yes. lawn care and ornamentals. Yes. It, those are licensed products as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is re the, this is the information reported to us by the applicators who are certified mm -hmm. by the agency to make this kind of application on care ornaments. I gotcha. Okay. okay. So yeah. Um, so and actually, just so you know, this does not include use by private individuals. You can buy neonicotinoid products. Well, let me make that up. You can't buy neonic. In some states, you can buy the neonicotinoid products uh, and not be certified. But anybody who is certified for a private as a private applicator doesn't have to report to us. So this does include any of the price. So any farmer who buys it as a private applicator and applies on their own property, they don't have to report how much they applied. So this only includes folks who are applying it on other people's property, essentially. That and sense. thank you, Emily, for putting those names into the chat for us. I think that will just um, help people relate to the active ingredients or the classes a little bit, a little bit easier. All right. We, we don't have any more questions, so if you want to continue. Okay, I'll keep moving here. Um, if I can get it to work, all of a sudden it's not working. Huh. Oh, there we go. Okay, so now I want to talk about the Agricultural Innovation Board, um, which is a, an advisory group that was established by the General Assembly in 2021. And it is has a number of functions, but it was a, it was a way for the uh, legislature to provide a way to advise the secretary on pesticide issues and some other agricultural related issues, such as use of agricultural plastics and uh, genetically engineered seeds, that kind of thing. But basically deal with some of the concerns folks have and, and some of the issues that we uh, could have uh, as a way to advise, you know, get a broad group of uh, uh, experience uh, and perspectives and provide that to the, to the secretary. Uh, so the Agricultural Innovation Board, our, our division, uh, we, we support the activities of the board. We, we arrange for the meetings, we you know, provide the information, we record the deliberations of the board. Everything that we've done, everything that the Agricultural Innovation Board does is all public. They're all public meetings, they're recorded. 
They're available. Uh, you can watch a YouTube video if you're really that interested uh, of the board meetings. Um, but anything, everything's available on our website. Uh, everything that's been considered and all the information. So the um, not going to get into naming the individual members, but just so you know who the the board members represent. Uh, and this is established by the legislature: conventional dairy industry, fruit and vegetable farming. Uh, grass-based non-dairy livestock farming, soil biologist, certified crop consultant, organic farming. Uh, UVM is represented on the uh, in the on the board for the Center for Sustainable Agriculture. The agency has some representation. Department of Health, Agency of Natural Resources, and then an environmental organization that advocates for policy regarding management. And that's the uh, Vermont Center for Eco Studies has a position on the board. So you know. Pretty broad uh, representation for different perspectives on on the issues that affect agriculture from the environmental perspective. Uh, the board has been focusing a lot of its activity on the issue of neonicotinoid treated seeds. Uh, they're specifically charged um, to advise the secretary on developing rules for best management practices for the use of nicotinoid treated seeds. There are seven specific uh, areas that the board was, or the secretary's uh, you know, charged with considering, which means then the board has to focus on those in developing the uh, recommendations. And those are the establishment of threshold levels where pest pressures required prior to the use of neonicotinoid treated seeds, the availability of non-treated seeds uh, that are, you know, uh, you know, specifically non-neonicotinoid treated seeds, uh, the economic impact from crop loss when treat seed uh, compared to crop yield when when these seeds are used, the relative toxicities of different treated article seeds. Uh, surveillance and monitor techniques for infield pest press pressure, ways to reduce pest harborage, and criteria system for approval. So those seven things were considered by the board during 17 public meetings starting in 2022. Um, the board heard or, or received information. I don't want to use the word testimony because it wasn't like testimony. It was just information provided by experts in the area. Um, and I haven't gone into the list of everybody who, who spoke there, but all, that's all on our website. You can go and look at it. Uh, but we did an extensive review of literature. We had a, um, a lot of expert witnesses. We had a lot of public comment uh, on those seven topics and really got into some detail on them. Uh, Heather was one of the folks who, who talked to us. Um, like I said, all that all that information is publicly accessible, and you can look at it. Uh, we have already provided one annual report to the legislature. We will provide another one before January fifteenth, and we are preparing a report. We just had our meeting yesterday, and sort of finalized the the text of that report, which is regarding the best management practices for non neonicotinoid treated um, article seeds. So, what did we so what did the uh, AIB learn? So this is a summarization of of the activity over those seventeen meetings. The and this is just a summary of some of the things that the the board um, learned. I guess um, that we understand is that you know neonicotinoids are toxic to non-target insects, and there is a risk of exposure. Uh, to small mammals and birds, that previous research evaluating corn yields for neonicotinoid treated seeds versus non-treated seeds shows an inconsistent or no significant differences in yield. The, there is a possible impact of the past use of neonicotinoid treated seeds on pes present pest pressures. or could be what's called a halo effect. That's a real... Uh, unknown area that needs to be researched that, but in the current market, the way seeds are provided to growers in Vermont and other areas, that the neonicotinoid treated seed is uh, 
an inexpensive way to prevent yield loss or crop stand loss from a couple of significant pests, one of them, which is the corn seed maggot, the other is water worm. But the corn seed maggot seems to be the one that really drives this. Uh, and that it, that purchasing non-neonicotinoid tree seeds is very limited. So because there's a lack of availability of tree, of seed that does, isn't treated with neonicotinoid insecticide, there, there's limited flexibility for variety selection or seed exchange when adjusting to planting conditions closer to planting time. We'll talk more about that. But uh, so anyway, that's sort of the general takeaway. And then sort of getting into some of the specifics on those things, um, the AIB, you know, learned that uh, seed purchasing occurs months ahead of the season, uh, September to November. So the seed that would be planted in 2024 has already been uh, either purchased or secured or arranged for planting. Uh, and that, you know, the seed characteristics and the treatment options have already been decided, essentially. And therefore, scouting the field uh, prior to planting doesn't really, it can't really influence the type of seeds that are being purchased because they've already been arranged. And that previous year's pest pressure levels are not a clear indicator of pest levels in the year that you're going to be planting. There are uh, relatively few methods available for scouting for corn seed maggot, and no economic thresholds have been established. There, there is a way to test for wireworm, uh, and there is an uh, established economic threshold. But again, the, the sampling fields for the presence of wireworms before you plant uh, in um, may not give you enough information to decide how you're going to, uh, what seed you're going to buy. Plus, um, there are other ways to to evaluate and and, and manage for wireworm. So the the limited availability of the untreated seed and uh, limited untreated varieties results in the fact that producers who order untreated seed cannot exchange for different maturities varieties closer to planting time if the weather changes or there's changes in management. Um, and that it's very difficult to buy corn seed uh, that is has fungicide only treatments as opposed to completely untreated with no none of the seed treatments versus you know uh, if, if the decision was made to excuse me um, purchase seed that had fungicide only on it but no neonicotinoid that's very difficult to do in the in the current market. Okay, again, we've already talked about this a little bit. The, the research comparing fungicide-only treated seed uh, to the, the neonicotinoid treated seed shows inconsistent yield differences. And uh, Heather, you're going to talk more about that, I imagine, right? Some of the work you've been doing? Yeah, I think we'll probably, in the last webinar, just kind of talk yeah. about some of the work. Right yeah. Here. So... Um, so we can spend more time talking about this later, I guess, but the whole idea here is that there's one of the items that the legislature asked the board to consider is, is there a yield advantage from using the, the treated seed versus the untreated seed? And a lot of the studies that uh, we evaluated and done in many places does not show a consistent yield advantage from using the seed. However, there are cases where there is a yield advantage, and those are cases where the corn seed maggot, uh, you had an outbreak of a corn seed maggot for either the culture, you know, the, the, the conditions in the field or the weather or the timing of the planting. And in those cases, there are significant yield differences where the, uh, the treated seed has been used. And that's where we get into the idea that the, the, the use of the insecticide treated seed is a, a inexpensive uh, insurance against a potentially catastrophic yield loss if you do have an outbreak of corn seed maggot in the field. Um, and that was something that I think the, the board recognized is that 
you know, it's it's not this it's not a simple matter of saying there's no difference between using the, the treated seed and the untreated seed. There are instances where if you have the treated seed, uh, you're better off than having the non-treated seed if you have an outbreak of corn seed magnet or some other pest. So um, so that's that's important. Um, the we did it. We did the other thing we looked at, of course, is the human health risk assessment uh, because of the fact that it's um, used in low amounts per seed and per field. Um, there and and the material is generally, you know, has low toxicity, and main toxicity. Essentially, there was not a human health risk associated or a significant human health risk associated with the. Um, the use of the treated seed. So that wasn't a factor in making a decision. Um, and the fact that they, you know, the one point there, neonicotinoids have a favorable human health profile compared to organophosphate insecticides, which, you know, have much higher uh, toxicity uh, rating. So then as far as ecological risk assessment, uh, we looked at uh, EPA has recently completed um, a number of uh, risk assessments for neonicotinoid insecticides. And, you know, they, they are uh, the most likely risk concern is for, for mammals and birds is from consumption of treated seed if, if it's available for them to consume. So there's some things you can do about that. Um, the Imidacloprid, clothianidin, and thiamethoxam are classified as highly toxic to honeybees, and they can have sublethal impacts on uh, honeybee physiology, re reproduction, behavior. The EPA has some proposed mitigation measures relative to treated seed uh, and additional language on the seed bag label uh, to cover and collect treated seeds spilled during loading and planting dispose of all excess treated seed by burying seed away from bodies of water and to not contaminate bodies of water and disposing planting equipment. There's a number of other things too we can talk about, but basically it's to minimize uh, exposure of uh, uh, organisms during the, the seed planting and handling process to avoid exposing uh, them to the insecticides. And then in the uh, ecological risk assessment, EPA stated that these risk mitigation measures were considered with the understanding of the high benefits associated with treat seed uses, which through their use have the potential to reduce overall neonicotinoid exposure and offer a lower overall ecological risk compared to foliar uses. Again, getting back to the idea that I'm putting it on the seed avoids having to do infro treatment or foliar treatment. Um, so the amount of active ingredient proceeds considerably less than the amount of active ingredient applied during infrared treatments. And, you know, our understanding and the discussion about the use of these treated seeds is that they do replace infrared treatment, uh, which therefore reduces the total amount applied dramatically. So other exposures um, that you, exposures to non-targets or the environment can come from the dust from vacuum planters, uh, soil dust carried from the previous season moved by any activity in the field, and also by contributing to abrasion of the seed, surface water after rain events within fields and adjacent the fields from fugitive dust can contain neonicotinoid residues and, and cause exposure that way. Residues born onto, flown onto flowering resources uh, can result in neonicotinoid. And this particular group, these particular set of uh, bullet points here, this is where I think we need to spend some time either today or a future uh, webinar. These are the, the uh, areas where uh, folks who use neonicotinoid treated seed can be aware of and take measures to mitigate impacts. So um, we should talk more about that. Uh, and, and Heather, is that going to be something we can talk about later or what? What do you think about that? Yes, I think um, in the last webinar, <clears throat> we can talk about these different um, projects that we're working on and other sort of opportunities 
and options that we hear, I think, throughout this webinar series. You know, it's really a time for people to, you know, contribute, give feedback, and see where we're going to go. So, yeah. Okay. I'm going to skip this next bullet point because Heather's going to talk about that. <laughs> um, so, we also learned about what's happening in Canada. And so, uh, the two provinces, Ontario and Quebec, have taken, uh, you know, specific action to restrict the use of neonicotinoid treated seeds. Um, in general, there's a federal level prohibition of talc and graphite as seed lubricants to reduce the risk of the seed treatments abrading off the seeds. And that's actually enforced on the label of the pesticides uh, that are used for that. Um, in Ontario, they've taken an approach where uh, uh, farmers who want to uh, plant neonicotinoid treated seeds have to obtain a one-time IPM certification training and a pest assessment report um, to, to, to use the seed. And our understanding uh, what's happened in Ontario is there's been a general transition to use of a different insecticide on the treated seed, a diamide, which if you remember back to the toxicity uh, profile and the, and the environmental fate profile have, um, you know, could be looked at as having more favorable, um, in some respects, some more favorable characteristics. But in, even in Ontario, our understanding is uh, as much as a third of the acre just still being treated or planted with neonicotinoid treated seed. Uh, in Quebec, uh, there's a fairly high uh, burden to um, be able to plant seed using neonicotinoids involves basically getting a professional agronomist uh, to perform an assessment and every year going out and, and you know, providing a, um, an assessment that you need the neonicotinoid treated seed. And as a result, the, um, it's pretty much transitioned to diamide treated seed. In, in Quebec. Uh, Heather, I see the number of comments in the chat. Do we need to stop and take questions or just keep rolling? Uh, we can stop, I think. Um, okay. There are you know, some comments and questions. So it, basically what you were talking about in relation to what you learned from our uh, Northern neighbors, uh, Somebody was uh, saying since 2019 restrictions on neonics in Quebec, farmers right. require written approval from agronomists for neonic use as part of their justi right. justification um, of the need. Is there anything the AIB learned from Quebec about how they scout and establish thresholds? So I don't know if there was anything in particular you learned. Yeah, so that was, you know, we had a couple of presentations uh, from folks from Quebec. And uh, the takeaway was that it wasn't really practical. Um, that as a result of the requirements for getting an agronomist to come in and, and do that kind of assessment, the the as a practical matter, it became easier or, or just more practical or more functional to not use the neonicotinoid treated seeds. Um, the other issue about scouting has to do with the, what we were talking about before, and we can talk more about it in other webinars, I guess, is, is because of the, um, the nature of occurrence of the corn seed maggot isn't predictable prior to the time you need to order the seed, if that makes any sense. So uh, one of the items that the General Assembly wanted the board to consider is whether there was a scouting regimen or an economic threshold uh, system that could be put in place, uh, similar to what they were proposing to use in Quebec or proposed to use in Quebec, and the conclusion of the board is it just wasn't practical because the seed has to be ordered, you know, the year before. And if you go out and scout about the time the corn seed mag would show up, it's too late. You've already 
you're already locked into what you're going to plan. Does that sound fair, Heather, as an example or an answer? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So. yeah. And I think we will definitely be diving into all of these topics more throughout the webinar series. So there are several people on the Cornell IPM extension team. I think some of them are on here today that have been um, looking at a variety of the things we've been talking about from kind of scouting programs, alternative control methods, um, et cetera. And so they're gonna be talking about their experiences and kind of what they're seeing in New York. Um, and John Tucker will be joining us as well, you know, really talking about um, crop management and pest management and um, really providing some information around no-till in particular, which and cover crops, um, and how that impacts, um, and the neonics and how that impacts, you know, productivity and pests. So I think we're going to be digging into all these topics quite a bit more um, throughout the webinar series. So yeah. hopefully okay. more um, more questions uh, will be answered. Okay. So were there other questions? Yeah. So. Um, another person, again, just asking about the halo effect. Has that been seen in Quebec? Um, I think you address, or you basically said there needs to be more work, which um, to the best of my knowledge as well, uh, I see Emily, um, not Emily, Sam put um, a paper in, in the chat that people could look at, but at least from what I've heard from other entomologists here in the US that has not been documented in the scientific literature for um, seed corn maggot and neonic at this time, but that is, you know, people hypothesis, hypothesize that that is actually happening, um, but it has not been well documented um, at this point. And maybe, I don't know, Sam, if this article does, but um, so I think, as you said, Steve, that's, you know, we don't know yet, but again, people think that's what could be happening. So right, I don't, it's, a, it's, yeah. it's a complex situation because in addition to the, you know, the corn seed maggot and the wire worm and everything, you know, the fair amount of the corn being planted has plant incorporated protectants, which are a factor. Uh -huh. um, you know, there, there's it's a complex situation, and I think that's, you know, if I had to summarize. You know everything that the AIB heard and learned, and uh, took away from the whole thing in, in, a, in a very short sentence. It would be that it's a complex situation. There are a lot of things to consider, and there are a lot of uh, unknowns about the best way to go forward. Um, there uh, are. Um, there is another question on, and I apologize, I didn't ask this one before, but. Um, Somebody would like to know if there are dairy farmers on the AIB? Yes. Yes. Okay. Already There's both an organic and a conventional dairy farmer on the AIB. Um, and then uh, another question was, do we know what percent of Vermont fields saw yield loss from um, corn seed maggot and wire worms before um, neonic seed treatments? We did, nobody, provided that information to AIB, um, I would uh, ask, I think probably the best source of information on that is UVM um, and the UVM agronomist who happens to be on the call, I think. Yeah. Um. <laughs> well, I will say that uh, neonic seed treatments came on the scene um, right, you know, a few years into, into my tenure here. So, they were just starting to be used um, in the kind of mid, you know, maybe 2005 or six here. Wasn't maybe until a couple years past that, that they really brought, you know, more broad scale use uh, came into play because um, pri prior to that was a choice if uh, farmers wanted their seed treated with neonics or not. Um, and then as the industry, I think, consolidated and also, um, you know, I guess I would say consolidated, but also saw, I don't know, you know, the complexities with dealing with all of these different inventories, they started treating all, uh, almost all the seed. And so um, it was, you know, seed is coming with the seed treatment 
whether a, a farmer chooses it or not. And that's, you know, part of the reason I think it's important uh, to hear what Steve was talking about is because I, you know, I think it is true that a, a lot of farmers maybe don't um, even understand that those seeds may be covered with this insecticide. Um, as far as crop losses go beside, before NSTs, um, other pesticides were used to control this pest. So it wasn't um, like people weren't using insecticide, they were using uh, organophosphates primarily, like Lorsban as an example. I know you don't like trade names, Steve, but that was a very popular oh, one. Yeah. Um, and a lot of farmers would recognize that name. Planters had insecticide boxes, which they actually don't really have anymore. And the farmers themselves would basically dump the cans of organophosphate into the insecticide box and away they would go. Um, so I don't, you know, like Steve said, I don't, I don't really think it was tracked necessarily. It is tracked um, nationally. And so um, that data does e exist. So even with seed treatments, there's still significant losses to these pests. Um, and I mean, personally, in the time that I've been here, completely devastated crops from um, seed corn maggot and wireworms. I've been called out to, you know, maybe less than less than 10, 10 events. And, and not that everybody would call me. I don't even know if some people would realize that that was actually the issue all the time because, you know, these issues happen really early in the season and are, you know, probably often misdiagnosed as just a poor stand because it was cold um, or, you know, any number of other factors. Um, so anyway, that was a really long answer to your question that we don't we don't know what the losses were before NSTs. And honestly, we don't really know necessarily what they are after either. People aren't, you know, that's not really being tracked. Okay. Right. Sorry. We, yeah, no, <laughs> that was a lot we, for not much. <laughs> yeah, there was a um uh, presentation to the AIB, which is in the in the material by uh I think a person, Dr. Shields, I think from um, uh, New York, who talked about you know su substantial losses in the past as a result of these pests prior to the use of the seeds in New York. Um, yeah, yeah. So, and there's also the um, uh, Cornell, the 2020 Cornell uh, report on the use of neonicotinoids in New York has some information about losses, and you know uh, the. Uh, uh, some information provided by the certified crop consultants in New York about what they'd anticipate losses to be if they weren't able to use the seeds. But anyway, that's that's in there. So, yeah. So we have about five minutes left, Steve. I'm not oh, sure gosh. how much <laughs> okay. how much we have left. <laughs> or four uh, minutes now. Um, sorry. If, um, no, that's fine. Yeah. So anyway, just a couple other things, then I'll skip to the um, the recommendations. So, um, so. You know, some of the things we learned about was the fate and transport of the neonicotinoids on the treated seed, that between 1.4 and 20% is taken up, actually uh, goes into the plant itself as it's growing, uh, 2 to 3% loss of dust, but that greater than 90% moves into soil, water, and non-target plants, with the idea that it's also degrading, too. It's not just, you know, all just sitting there. Um, there's a relationship between the type of tillage practice and resulting pest pressures, which I'm sure Heather's going to uh, get into. Um, and as an important factor for, for growers to consider. Uh, conservation tillage practice can reduce corn seed maggot populations. And I believe you're gonna have a presentation about that from uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and there's an opportunity to learn economic impacts of using untreated seed and planting later in season to avoid pest, peak pest pressure. So um, if I can get this, that's decided to stop working again. Oh. Okay. so. Um, just going right to recommendations, as a result of consideration of all this information, like I said before, if I had to sum it up, I'd say the the, the, um, the consideration was that it's complicated. Um, the, the AIB did not come out with specific BMPs to address the seeds at this time. Um, so there wasn't 
in a, a, a sense from the board that there were specific measures that they could direct growers to use in the sense of a BMP adopted by rule on how to do this. The recommendations were to, to help further understand the issues in Vermont through research and to help educate growers. Uh, we also, the board also support efforts to increase pollinator habitat without impacting agricultural production. And there was a little discussion about monetary programs to mitigate potential losses for folks who don't use neonicotinoid treated seeds. So, um, so in, in, you know, in terms of the, and this is all in the reports, uh, support additional research is a big one, uh, looking at this halo or legacy effect, non-target dust movement, uh, effectiveness, unknown limitations, and market availability of seed lubricant alternatives to talcum graphite, and then the impact of managing and mowing buffers at the planting time, the time that tree seeds are used to reduce to reduce pollinator attractive plants, and therefore uh, exposure. Uh, develop IPM guidance on guidance for growers on how to reduce environmental impact. And there's a lot of information there, but it has to do a lot with the the tillage practices, make sure growers understand what's going on and are kept up to date on re relevant research, and then educate growers about seed label language and how to follow the label, uh, support and promote efforts to increase pollinator habitat without increase, impacting agricultural, and then build in a mechanism to review and evaluation. So at the meeting we just had yesterday, we you know sort of summarized all this, but the um, one of the takeaways is that the AIB is going to keep working on this issue, uh, that, that we're not done. We don't have a, you know, a neatly wrapped set of BMPs that was recommended to the secretary to go forward in rulemaking. We have to keep looking at this. We have to keep doing research. We have to keep educating the growers. And I'm really happy that uh, uh, Heather put this webinar series together so we can talk about this uh, and, you know, keep uh learning and figuring out what we need to do. So with that, I'll go ahead and wrap it up. So Heather, back to you. And I'll stop sharing as soon as I can. Oh, sorry, I was talking away. So okay. for <laughs> those that have to leave, I put up the QR code. Um, I'm putting up a pop-up poll as well, if people could answer that. Um, and if there are any, we will be discussing the recommendations again in the last webinar, making sure uh, we get feedback on those, but also thinking about, you know, where, where are we going to go with all of this? And after hearing from all the speakers, just really getting, getting that feedback this you know, it's not going to go away. <laughs> the recommendations uh, for the near future are, you know, are being submitted, but the conversation is going to continue to happen. So I want to make sure that we get people's feedback. Um, okay, so I'm going to end that poll, and I have one more for those that are still on. I don't know how to get rid of that. Da, da, da. I don't know where it went, but anyway. Oh, there it is. Nope. Okay. I guess I missed it. Unless Susan sees it somewhere. It looks like they're gone. All right. Well, we are at the top of one o'clock. Oh, there. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> I hit the wrong one. I hit number two before I hit number one. Um, so the CCA credits up here, I'm scanning it for myself. And I want to thank Steve again. That was really great. It definitely helps us set the stage for the rest of the webinars. Our next webinar will be on Thursday, and we'll be joined by Samantha Alger of the University of Vermont. She is um, heading up the B Lab at UVM. She's a research assistant professor there, and she's going to be talking to us about neonicotinoids and their impacts on pollinators. Um, and we're be excited to hear from you, Sam, and everything and the knowledge that you have to offer our group. So with that, thank you everyone for attending, and I look forward to um, seeing you all. <clears throat>
the next webinars. So right, have a you. great, great day. Thanks, Steve. Right, thank you. All right.